Hello, my name is Christopher Renstrom, and I want to welcome you to Christopher Renstrom Astrology, where we will be asking the question, what planet is he on? And the person we'll be asking that question of is Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb. So, what planet is he on? The answer is Venus. That's because Robert Oppenheimer was born on April 22nd, 1904, which makes him a Taurus. But the ruling planet of Taurus is Venus. Now, just a quick note. I tend to work with ruling planets a little differently than some other astrologers. Other astrologers will see the ruling planet as the ruler of the ascendant, or maybe even perhaps the final dispositor of the chart. For me, the ruling planet is the planet that rules your sun sign. So anyone born under the zodiac sign of Taurus is going to have Venus as their ruling planet. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Venus is going to be in the same zodiac sign. So what is a ruling planet? You can think of your ruling planet as your patron saint, your den mother, your corporate sponsor and life coach all wrapped up into one. Your ruling planet, to me, is just as important as your sun, moon, and ascendant, because it's where your ruling planet is positioned in the sky that you want to look to see whether you're going through good times or bracing for some challenging periods. So, what is it like to be a Taurus like Robert Oppenheimer and to have your ruling planet in the zodiac sign of Aries? because that is where Robert Oppenheimer has his ruling planet. First of all, let's talk a little bit about Venus. Venus is named after the Roman goddess of love and beauty. So things dealing with culture and with music, good taste, fine wines, and exquisite food and lovely company are going to be things that are very important to people who are born under the planet Venus. If you're born under the planet of Venus, it is said that you are a child of Venus because Venus is essentially your ruling or your parent planet. So to be born under Venus means that you have a melodic voice, you have a love of literature or of music or of culture, and you love the good things in life, the finer things in life. And a lot of times you may even have exquisite taste. You definitely believe in going up through the social ladder. You may not have started very high up in society, but if you have your way, you're going to do well later on in your life, either through marriage or through business partnerships or relationships. Venus is always seeking to expand its life through the people that it knows. That can be through social connections or by having people in their corner that they believe want the best for them. These are usually the general Venus attributes. Now, if you have Venus in the zodiac sign of Aries, well, that colors your Venus a little bit. Why does that color your Venus a little bit? The reason it colors your Venus a little bit, a little bit red, is because Aries is ruled by Mars, named after the god of war. So where Venus wants to be harmonious and wants to get along with everyone and, and have lovely romantic relationships and pleasant conversation and differences taken care of over a bottle of wine and good food, when you put Venus in the zodiac sign of Mars, there's a tendency to attract a lot of strife, envy, and competition, things that are related to Mars. This idea of Venus as your ruling planet, being the ruling planet of Taurus, in the zodiac sign of Mars, is also associated with Venus being a morning star. Now, you might be like, okay, well, how does that work if I was born at sunset? Well, let's make this simple. In other words, Venus in Aries is in the sign that precedes, comes before the sun, which is in Taurus. So, on the sunrise of the day that you were born, and let's say you were born around sunrise, Venus would have preceded you in the nighttime sky. In other words, if someone was up at maybe like 5 a.m. in the morning and they looked outside, they would have seen Venus, and you can't miss her on a cloudless night. They would have seen Venus brightly lit 
in the dawn sky before the rays of the sun emerged, announcing the approach of Taurus. So Venus as a morning star is different than Venus as an evening star. As a morning star, Venus rises in front of the sun, who's going to rise after it. And as an evening star, the sun has set and Venus appears in the nighttime sky and is following the sun down under the Earth's horizon. So Venus as an evening star was always seen as a sign of peace and romance. But Venus as a morning star, Venus as a morning star had a reputation for war, a, a reputation for war that was recognized not only in the Mideast, where astrology originates, but also in Mesoamerican cultures as well. So Venus rising before the sun as a morning star fits the uh, chart of Robert Oppenheimer, who is the father of the atomic bomb, especially because the atomic bomb was detonated at 529 a.m. before sunrise. And so the atomic bomb itself became a rising fire or light in the sky before the sun approached. There is a very strong connection to the morning star placement of Venus in the astrological sign of Aries, named after the god of war and also associated to strife and conflict. One of my favorite moments in the film, Oppenheimer, which was nominated for the Academy Award, um, comes right at the very beginning. Uh, we see a very uh, distraught and melancholic young Robert Oppenheimer, and he's at Cambridge University, I believe, and he's studying science or physics, rather, or maybe both at the same time. He's studying something which requires laboratory experiments, and he looks very harassed, and he looks very distressed, and, and he looks very full of angst, this young Robert Oppenheimer. And he's working on a lab experiment, and maybe he's distracted, or maybe he's bored by the experiment. For whatever reason, he knocks over test tubes or equipment and sends them shattering to the floor. And so everyone looks up. And so his professor, who was also his mentor in real life, Patrick Blackett, shames him in front of the classroom. You, you know, you, you, klutz, you, you clumsy Robert Oppenheimer, you, you know. And, and it's very much um, a bowl in a china shop moment where he just, you know, tundles over the experiment and, and it falls down and crashes the floor and, and the other students laugh or maybe there's an embarrassed silence or something along those lines. Anyway, this very distraught Robert Oppenheimer, who's full of visions of exploding stars and bashing neurons and cosmic forces and these sorts of things, these are being intercut at the beginning of the film to show not only his brilliance, but also his state of mind, which is clearly agitated. Um, he's, he's having these, you know, rollover thoughts and epiphanies and things like this that are sort of driving him a little bit mad, or that's what the viewer is led to believe. Well, he's embarrassed um, by his mentor, the professor, you know, um, uh, m m pointing out how he had shattered the test tubes. And, and furthermore, his mentor says, you are not going to go to the lecture, which is being given by visiting scholar Niels Bohr. Um, and you're going to have to stay here and clean up after your mess. You know, it's just kind of like Cinderella moment or something like that. We're all going to the ball or we're all going to this lecture given by Niels Bohr, but not you, Bob. You're going to stay here and you're going to clean up after your bull in a china shop mess that you made. And so he does. Um, but he sneaks off to the lecture anyway because he he has to see Bohr speak. And, and this is like a revelatory moment where he realizes this is a great mind who's going to understand his mind and maybe help him frame things in a sort of inarticulate atomic bomb kind of way. But where in Cinderella, she goes to the ball and gets the prince and things, and happily, it takes a decisively negative turn in the film Oppenheimer. Uh, Oppenheimer is so angry at the professor for having um, embarrassed him and, and, and full of jealousy and, and, and spite that he takes a green apple in the film, and he injects cyanide into it um, and creates literally a poisoned apple. And so he leaves this poisoned apple on the desk of his professor. And in a moment where Niels Bohr has come to, you know, be introduced to this young Oppenheimer um, uh, and sees the apple on the desk and picks it up almost to bite into it, you know, Oppenheimer quickly grabs the apple and flings it to the floor and, <laughs> you know, as if he's just saved him from a grenade that was going to go off or something like that. 
it's a very sort of uh, uh, overdramatic moment in the film um, and done very skittishly and very quickly. But it is based on a real life incident. Evidently, Oppenheimer did poison an apple. It's in question as to whether it was cyanide or not and left it for his professor. And obviously the professor didn't eat it. Uh, but it did come out later that he had tried to poison the professor with an apple and he was almost thrown out of university, except uh, his parents intervened on his behalf and he was saved. Why is Christopher going on about this poisoned apple? Apples and Venus have a long history together. We know from the different mythologies of Venus that apples don't bode very well. Um, and they certainly don't uh, when Venus is involved. And remember that Venus is in Aries, which is uh, a Mars ruled sign. And Venus is said to be in detriment in the zodiac sign of Aries. She doesn't do very well under Aries. Uh, and the reason why is because Aries is full of strife and contention. And Venus wants to be the opposite. So Venus, if you have your Venus in Aries, has a tendency to attract strife and contention into your life, not only in romantic relationships, but in professional relationships as well. But here is the ruling planet. We see that a negative Venus, which is envy and anger and shame at having, you know, and, and shamed because the vanity had been embarrassed in front of everyone and now, you know, wants to plant this poison apple. Well, this can't help put you in mind of examples of apples and Venus. Uh, we have famously the tree of knowledge where it's Eve, the woman, you know, who picks the apple and seduced by the uh, snake, turns around and seduces Adam, tempts Adam to take a bite of the apple and basically ruins it for all of humankind. OK, so we have that example. Uh, we have the poisoned apple from Snow White. Uh, where the evil queen, who has been obsessed about Snow White's beauty, asking the mirror ad infinitum, who's the fairest one of them all? And the mirror keeps answering Snow White, Snow White, Snow White, get over it, Snow White, you know, and she's like, I'm going to kill Snow White. <laughs> and so she shows up at the door of the seven dwarves and offers Snow White the apple and Snow White can't resist and takes a bite and falls into a dead faint. Okay, um, luckily she's awakened by the kiss of the prince later, but this is a poisoned apple. Um, and then, of course, the uh, apple's greatest association to Venus is the Judgment of Paris, where Iris, who is the uh, sister of Mars, um, daughter of the night and sister of Mars, um, is not invited to a wedding. Uh, she's kind of the archetypal 13th fairy who doesn't get invited to the christening or the wedding, and it's never a good idea to not invite them, but that's a story for another time. She doesn't get invited. She feels snubbed. Socially, she tosses this golden apple onto this wedding table where they're having a banquet celebrating this wedding. And it, on inscribed in the apple are the words to the fairest, you know, and immediately three goddesses reach for it. It's Athena, it's Hera, and it's Aphrodite. And they're all three like, this is mine. No, this is mine. No, this is mine. You know, and they're about to have a big argument about it until it's decided later that they'll find someone on the planet of Earth to award the apple to one of the goddesses and thus settle the con contest, the competition. That ends up being Paris, who awards the golden apple to uh, Aphrodite rather than Hera and Athena. And each of the goddesses are presenting Paris with visions of his future. Hera promises him um, a, a kingdom, worldly fame. And uh, Athena promises him uh, valor and, and conquest and triumph and armies. Uh, things. Both of these things are things that men would want. But um, Aphrodite or Venus, she subscribes to the idea that when the going gets tough, the tough get naked. And so what she does is that she drops her gowns and she's like, oh, I dropped my gowns. I'm standing here naked in front of you. <laughs> Do you like what you see? And he's like, here's the apple. I love you. <laughs> okay, so he awards the golden apple to her. And she takes a bite of it. And she says, good choice. And that, of course, she awards him the most beautiful woman in the world, who's Helen of Troy. She happens to be already married. And this starts the Trojan War. Why did Christopher go into that whole digression? Because Venus, when she's in a morning star attribute, and in Robert Oppenheimer's chart, she's rising in the zodiac sign of Aries. She is associated to war. And war can take place because of lust, 
or 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 envy or possessiveness, covetousness of someone else's property or lands or people. Or wars can take place when you do things like walk off with the wife of one of the most powerful military generals on the planet, Menelaus, and take her to Troy and, you know, cause cause this this scandal, this love scandal, which, of course, Paris gives his name to the city of Paris, and city of Paris loves love scandals. But um, back then, uh, the Greeks didn't, and it was met with the Trojan War. So associations to conflict, to war, to troubled relations, are all connected to the idea of a Venus in Aries. Venus is in a Mars-ruled sign, in the instance of Taurus being a morning star connected to war and battle and to conflict. Now, what is Venus in Aries like? What is Venus in Aries supposed to stand for? Well, I often refer to Venus in Aries as a telenovela Venus, all right? Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with telenovelas, uh, but these are Spanish soap operas uh, where there's lots of um, melodrama and strife and conflict and jealousy and love triangles and all these horrible things that are going on and they're absolutely fabulous. But anyway, Oppenheimer indeed had a telenovela Venus. Oppenheimer had a tendency to draw troubled women into his life, into his orbit. And this is shown in the film with, with, with three particular uh, women. The first, it was Jean Tatlock, who was a communist psychiatrist that he first met in 1936. I believe he was like 10 years older than her, and she's like a student at the time. And she's um, a communist, and she's a very hard-edged woman. There's nothing that's uh, very sort of soft or feminine about her. Um, in fact, in the film, he presents her with a bouquet of flowers and she takes them and she dumps them in a waste paper basket and she says, I don't like flowers. And if you're going to see me, don't bring flowers. I mean, she's anti-flower, okay? Which, as you can see, right off the moment is a Venus in Aries, <laughs> right off the bat. She's not going to have any of this. Uh, she's Mars ruled, not Venus ruled. And this is the type of energy that he's drawing into his life, a Mars type of energy. Um, and so she's also battling with depression. And she's portrayed in the film as being mentally troubled. Uh, the mental is very important because, as you know, in astrology, Aries, which is the zodiac sign that Venus is in, in Oppenheimer's chart, Aries rules the head. We know that Mercury rules the mind. And so we associate, for instance, the zodiac signs, Gemini and Virgo, with Mercury being very cerebral and analytical and things like that. But Aries is the head. We think of it often in terms of being headstrong or Aries, the ram, head budding. Aries rules the head and how well the head is doing. And so with Venus in her detriment in the zodiac sign of Aries, Oppenheimer is drawing into his life a woman who is mentally troubled. She's battling depression, yet she was his truest love. She also is a very, she's studying psychology. She's also a very well-read woman and a very, uh, she, there's a great love of literature that she has. In fact, I think in real life, her father was a Chaucerian academic. And she introduces Oppenheimer to John Donne's poetry, who's an English poet. And what's interesting about that is it's John Donne's poetry that Oppenheimer falls in love with, you know. He's introduced to the poetry by her. And it's also where he got the idea of using the word Trinity as the code name for the first nuclear test. In a letter written in 1962, which is housed in the uh, Los Alamos archives, there's a letter asking Oppenheimer where he came up with the code name Trinity. Like, what was that all about? And Oppenheimer responds in this letter that he wasn't clear on why he chose the name, but he knows the thoughts that were in his mind when he chose the name. And what he was thinking of was John Donne's 14th sonnet, which begins, Batter my heart, three-personed God. For you, as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand. Overthrow me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me. Which are very sort of powerful and 
turbulent words if you think about them. You know, he invokes the Trinity, the three-faced God, right? But with this kind of destruction only to remake, you know, anew. And it's a very powerful uh, piece of poetry here. And fascinating that that was what was in his mind when he thought of, oh, let's use Trinity as the code name for the atomic bomb, for the detonation of the atomic bomb. So these words might very well have described Oppenheimer's relationship to Tatlock, who winds up uh, committing suicide. Or it, these words, uh, these powerful words of John Donne might very well have described the relationship that Oppenheimer had to the bomb itself. Then again, it could have been both. The second woman who plays a prominent role in the film and in Oppenheimer's life is his wife, Kitty, Kitty Oppenheimer whom he meets during his on-again, off-again relationship with Tatlock. Now, Kitty, when he meets her, was an aspiring biologist. And uh, Robert Oppenheimer was actually going to become, or winds up becoming, her fourth husband. Uh, Kitty's first marriage was to a musician, and it was annulled, probably because of sexual incompatibility. Her second marriage was to a communist organizer in Ohio who left to go fight in the Spanish Civil War, and Kitty was supposed to go and join him in Spain, but she doesn't because she finds out that he was shot dead in the head uh, during fighting in the Spanish Civil War. And so her third marriage ends up being to a British doctor, a British doctor who's a kind sort of gentleman, but a bit of a bore, and whom she leaves for Oppenheimer. I like to go with this description because what I want you to see is that Venus is in detriment in the zodiac sign of Aries. Aries is ruled by Mars, uh, which can describe a very sort of troubled person. Venus rules relationships. Venus is going to describe the person that, or the type of personality that you're drawing into your life. A lot of times we look to the seventh house for that, and that's a good idea. But I also like to look to Venus. And when you have Venus as a ruling planet, Venus is going to describe the type of person you're drawing into your life and the character of those relationships. So in our first relationship, we have a psychologist, someone who is basically a head shrinker, as they used to say in the uh, 70s, shortened to shrink, um, someone who's dealing with the life of the mind, um, who's connected to Oppenheimer in a very Venusian way through literature, um, and, is, and is portrayed in the film as being very, very sexual. We know that Jean Tatlock herself was very troubled about her own sexuality, um, and is said to have said uh, that um, she went out with men to prove that she wasn't gay. And, and so she would sort of like take on these, these men and sort of like engage them sexually. Uh, in an attempt to show herself that she wasn't really gay, uh, but she, but indeed she felt that she was very drawn to women. So this great distress is playing out in the, this version of Venus in Aries. When we come to Kitty as being a second version of Venus in Aries, uh, this is a woman who's been married four times. Um, one of them was to someone who was like fighting in a Spanish Civil War across the ocean, and she was going to go join him there, I guess take up arms and, and fight in the war. So she has a very Mars type of quality here. Uh, and when I say Mars type of quality, it's because Mars rules the zodiac sign of Aries where Venus is posited. Um, and she, as you can imagine, leaves, uh, you know, led or had a very troubled life herself. Uh, Kitty struggled with alcoholism. In the film, as she's depicted, she's a negligent parent. She's someone who really can't deal with raising a child. In the film, there's a scene where the child is just screaming and she can't deal with the baby anymore. And she goes to Oppenheimer, who's also sort of looking at her like, what do we do with this baby? And they go to a, a couple who's a friend of theirs and they ask if they can leave the baby there. Maternal instincts aren't exactly really strong with Kitty, or at least they weren't strong with the first child. And again, you know, was it her lack of maternal instincts or, or maternal ability, or was she perhaps having a depression? following the childbirth. These things happened and they weren't necessarily identified or talked about at the time when Oppenheimer and Kitty have their first child. Um, 
the two were also said to fight constantly. Uh, part of it, of course, was was maybe uh, uh, Kitty's alcoholism that she struggled with. But Kitty also wanted to be a biologist and finds herself put into this housewife mode. So she fights with Oppenheimer constantly, and they're known to have had a very tumultuous uh, marriage. Things that one would expect with a ruling planet in the zodiac sign of Aries. Um, but Kitty stands by him. She stands by him through thick and thin. And in fact, she stands by him when uh, news of his love affairs come out during his security hearing for the Atomic Energy Commission, which followed the detonation of the atomic bomb. The American government was going to set up an atomic commission that would uh, govern over nuclear weapons in the country. And Oppenheimer, who had headed the Manhattan Project, was um, tagged for being on this commission. Um, but there were questions as to his uh, patriotism and his affiliation to the United States of America. And so the FBI did a background check on him. And during the hearings, and Kitty was sitting there, she had to hear that he had um, gone back to uh, Jean Tatlock and that they were having an affair. And um, we know this because that the uh, agent shadowing him uh, watched uh, through the bedroom windows. And um, and so he had gone back to Gene Tatlock, who uh, friends of his regarded as being the true love of his life. Uh, and it's during that affair when he goes back to her that that Gene Tatlock ends up committing suicide. And so uh, Kitty's listening to this. And uh, Kitty is uh, also listening to how their good friend uh, Ruth Tolman also had an affair with Robert Oppenheimer. And yet she was, she, she stood by him, uh, which is something, and I'll describe a little bit later, which is something you see with a Venus in Aries. Uh, ultimately, Oppenheimer loses the clearance uh, in part because of his communist sympathies. Uh, communism was very big in the 1930s and, and the 20s. Um, it was seen as sort of an alternative way of, of, of bringing the world together. In, in a harmonious way by getting rid of uh, economic classes and things. Uh, this is before the reality of Stalinism was really known. And it was something that was very much espoused on different universities and college campuses, which is where Oppenheimer uh, uh, is during this period of time. It's, it's uh, UC Berkeley. And so, um, but ultimately that results, as you see in the film, uh, why he loses the clearance. The fact that he's having affairs with other women didn't really speak much to his character, but Kitty takes it and she stands by him. So what about this third woman that he is said to have had an affair with? Her name is Ruth Tolman, another psychologist. So you're seeing the head theme. <laughs> um, the first one, uh, Jean Tatlock, is a psychologist, but she's battling uh, depression. Um, the uh, second one, Kitty, is very headstrong. She uh, clearly comes across just, you know, in her marriages and things like that as, as being very passionate in love and, and going to stand by uh, whoever she's with, um, except for the musician that she annuls the marriage and the third British professor that she dumps in, uh, in favor of Oppenheimer. But, you know, she's a woman who's making decisions about her own life. Um, and she's also to have said at some point, I think it was around the hearings, yeah, yeah, I guess uh, he had this big affair with Jean Tatlock. but. Um, I'll tell you something, he didn't know how to make love very well until when we first started out, you know? And so she actually said, you know, I kind of taught him how to do it, or at least some variations on the theme, which is, if you think about it, a very Venus and Aries type of thing that, that would be said. Um, but there was Ruth Tolman, which came out in the hearings, who's another psychologist. She and her husband were mathematics professors. Her husband was a mathematics professor. They were friends of Oppenheimer. But Ruth and Robert were especially close friends. Um, and Oppenheimer's secretary said that he always carried a letter of hers in the breast pocket of his jacket, uh, you know, something that was very, very close to him. Uh, in fact, there's no proof that they actually ever had an affair. It was a malicious rumor that was started by one of Oppenheimer's fellow physicists, Ernest Lawrence, who had a long list of grievances against Oppenheimer. So here, you know, I'm tempted to sort of make the analogy, but you can kind of see the three goddesses that we spoke about with the golden apple. 
you know, um, there's Gene Tatlock, who is very much the love of his life. And this is a Venus in Aries. And so it, it's, 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 she's at a place of distress um, and conflict with herself about her sexuality and her feelings. Um, and, and then you have Kitty, who's the wife. She's the Juno or the Hera figure. She's, she's standing by her man, but everyone described her as very jealous and possessive. Um, other people dispute that. I mean, after all, what would you be like if you had to go off to Los Alamos in the uh, you know early '40s to work on a project that you couldn't talk to people about, and here you were like the housewife, and you know you had to raise your kid there in a town that was built by Oppenheimer for the children of scientists. But anyway, um, so I could see her being a little bit, but standing by the marriage, which Hera does by Zeus, and then um, the uh, third one. Uh, Ruth Tolman, I sort of see as Athena, you know, um, they, according to friends and themselves, they, they never had an affair that, that wasn't really their bond or their draw to one another. Their bond to one another was, um, their thoughts, you know, that they had an intellectual relationship. And I think they had a very strong conversational, uh, camaraderie between the two of them. I think it's fascinating. She's a psychologist like Jean Tatlock is, and perhaps, what Ruth offered was someone to talk to about his troubles and his problems and the things that weighed on his mind. And perhaps she gave him wisdom in an Athena-like way and gave him wise counsel um, how to uh, deal with all these sorts of things. So this kind of deals with, I wanted to sort of share with you what I feel is sort of the uh, romantic side of the Venus and Aries. But Venus and Aries plays out also in other areas of Robert Oppenheimer's life. And that's with his fall from grace. So Oppenheimer, after the uh, atomic bomb is detonated, um, and, and then it's seen as being a success and it hasn't lit the world on fire, which was the great fear. Um, and then it is uh, detonated uh, over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, Oppenheimer is horrified uh, by the results and um, realizes that this is like really destructive. And America is pushing at that time for the development of an even more destructive than the atomic bomb, and that would be the hydrogen bomb. And so um, now a note that I want to make very quickly here is Oppenheimer is called the father of the atomic bomb. And so a lot of times people will say, OK, like, did he invent it? Did he create it? What exactly was it? Um, Oppenheimer didn't create the atomic bomb. It was created by a group of scientists who worked together. And what he did is that he led the building of the bomb, that's the Manhattan Project, but he did not conceive it, he did not perfect it, and he did not order or direct its use. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind about this person. On one hand, you can see the Torian qualities of bringing people together into a work group, you know, with the v Venus bringing people together in a work group and, and getting the best minds and the best talents to work on this weapon. But he is not the one who conceives of it, and he is not the one who invents it. But he is the one who organizes the physicists. He is the one who selects the scientists, gets the right people involved. And this is very Venusian, because he knows the right people. Back in the 80s, they used to say, you know, he had a great Rolodex file. So he knew the right people to contact and to bring in to work on the bomb. And in that way, it's very Venusian because he knows who to bring in. And many of them say yes and go ahead and do it. But he is not the inventor of the atom bomb. The Soviets test their first atomic device in 1949. And this frightens America and sends America into a panic, uh, which is basically we're going to lose our lead with the atomic bomb uh, if we don't maintain it. And so the next step is the hydrogen bomb, you know, to show our dominance and to show our authority. And um, it, the person who was chairing the Atomic Energy Commission at this time was one Louis Strauss, um, who's played by Robert Downey Jr. in the movie, and he does an excellent job. And um, he is chairing the Atomic Energy Commission, and he sees the hydrogen bomb as being a necessary de uh, deterrent to stopping Russia from going any further. Um, Oppenheimer resists uh, Louis Strauss. He disagrees with what he has to say. And um, he really says, we, this is going to accelerate into an arms race if we're not careful here. 
and the answer isn't going forward with a hydrogen bomb. The answer is in showing the world that, you know, our civilization is capable of mass destruction. And by bringing together greater minds than ours um, to make sure that this doesn't happen again. We don't want to show dominance here because that will continue war. Okay. Um, what we want to strive for here is peace. Um, now that we know that this can be done, this is a horrible thing, so let's not do it. So this is Venus kind of asserting herself uh, behind the, um, the Aries uh, uh, veneer. Okay, so, so it's not war in search of peace. It's war is a horrible thing. This is the ultimate statement about war. And so we should enter into peace because we never want to see this happen again. We're going into the 1950s at this point and McCarthyism. And there is, if you're familiar with McCarthyism and the Red Scare, there is a big purge to get rid of communists in the state departments. And Robert Oppenheimer, as you can tell from the different uh, women that I was describing, knew communists. He knew them quite well. And he played around with the idea of joining the Communist Party, but he never really pledged allegiance to it. He wasn't comfortable with that, but he hung out with communists, just like, I don't know, in the 1950s, Jack Kerouac would hang out with bohemians. I mean, it wasn't seen as being a big deal at the time. But there was a Soviet spy who was part of Los Alamos, one of the scientists working there, who was British, and he did leak the secrets to Russia. And Strauss was holding... Oppenheimer accountable for this in Oppenheimer's security clearance hearing. And this is when Oppenheimer's enemies seized on his affiliations with the Communist Party. Remember, all affiliations are ruled by Venus. And I'm sure a couple of you out there have already been like, Venus and Aries, red, communists are red, you know, right, the red scare. Okay, so here we have it. Okay. And so Venus rules over all alliances and associations. It's not just romantic relationships or business partnerships. It's any sort of affiliation or association that you have, maybe with a bowling league or a communist party. Okay, so, um, so his enemies seized on his association with communism, or with communists at least, and his own known romantic dalliances to really smear him. And they succeeded in doing that. And Strauss was impassioned to do this out of jealousy of Oppenheimer. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. plays it wonderfully in the film of him having been snubbed, you know, by Oppenheimer, who comes across as a bit of an elitist. He was from a very well-to-do family that had Picassos in the living room, along with maybe a Van Gogh or two. So he was very elite. There was nothing about him that was like common man or whatever. Uh, so that already says that he would have made a poor communist, but he was very elite and a bit of a snob. He's described as having spoken with a little bit of a British accent and was very soft-spoken and often looked to the side when he was speaking, didn't really look people directly in the eye. Um, but Strauss is, is obsessed with uh, conquering Oppenheimer, who was praised as Prometheus, you know, the person who had brought fire from heaven and, and enlisted it to uh, bring the end of World War II at this point. I mean, it doesn't matter that World War II had ended and then Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed, but um, who was praised with having, you know, brought fire from the sky in the sort of Promethean heroic way of ensuring, you know, that no wars would ever take place again. But that wasn't to happen. He, he was smeared by this McCarthy-esque commission, which was meant to get rid of uh, communists. And he was being painted as a communist and a womanizer. And what's interesting, and they play it up in the film as well, um, Kitty becomes very angry with Oppenheimer when, when he becomes very passive. Um, he doesn't try to fight the charges. He doesn't try to argue back. He, he merely becomes passive, which can be a very Venusian and even a Torian way a uh, uh, place of going. I mean, Taurus usually has a very low threshold for anger, or it takes a lot to get a Taurus angry. I mean, if you if you wave around something red, <laughs> they will charge. Um, but Taurians have a tendency to resist, you know, resist things like anger. Uh, they don't like it. And so his passivity in the face of accusations that were leveled against him 
about being a communist sympathizer were regarded by friends of his as maybe his way of punishing himself for the Manhattan Project, his way of uh, accepting public shame in punishment for lives lost in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He was certainly very committed to a bomb never being detonated again. Yet, before we see Robert Oppenheimer as this romantic Promethean self-sacrificing hero, we need to remember that during these same proceedings, he named names, which was a thing that was done during the Red Scare. If the heat was on with senators accusing you of being a communist and, and basically blackballing you and ruining your life economically and socially, you could perhaps bypass it or even escape it if you named names. And that's exactly what Oppenheimer did. He named names and he basically ruined the lives of several people, including a German refugee physicist, Bernard Peters, who had been in Dachau, and Hakon Chevalier, a fellow Berkeley professor with whom he had established the school's branch of a teacher's union before World War II. Oppenheimer even posthumously named Tatlock. He even named her as being a communist. And it was only because his security clearance was revoked at the end of this show trial, this sham trial, that he's now seen as a victim primarily of McCarthyism. But the truth is he betrayed those who were closest to him. So the story of Robert Oppenheimer is not only the story of a man who's betrayed by his fellow scientists in this uh, uh, committee, uh, which is meant to defame him, to prevent him from joining the Atomic Commission in the 1950s, but he in turn goes and betrays. Betrayal is something that is very much associated to Venus in a Mars sign or Venus if she is retrograde in your chart. And so this is in keeping with the placement of the ruling planet as a morning star in the zodiac sign of Aries. But if you think about it, you know, betrayal and 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 the fall from 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 a height, things that are connected to Venus and Aries, um, it's very much reminiscent of Prometheus himself in Greek mythology. And you can see the Venus and Aries themes playing out in the story of Prometheus himself, um, whom Oppenheimer is likened to, um, and, the, and the film Oppenheimer is based on the book Oppenheimer, an American Prometheus. Who is Prometheus? Prometheus was a Greek titan. That is the generation that precedes the Olympians who were headed by Zeus. The titans were allied with Saturn, Kronos who had overthrown his father Uranus. He had actually castrated his father and separated heaven from earth. And he was allied with the Titans, who were basically old gods associated to the sun, to the moon. This is before these governances are, are, are reassigned. All right, they first belong to the Titans. And uh, the most favored, pretty much the most favored of all the Titans was Prometheus. And his name means forethinker, to think before. And so uh, it's not really clear whether Prometheus had the gift of prophecy or was so brilliant that he had this foresight, but Prometheus was seen as someone that you turn to for wise counsel and for strategy. And so when Zeus leads the Olympians in a war against Saturn and the Titans, which is basically known as the War in Heaven, which takes place uh, in, in early Greek mythology, the the gods, the Titans and the Olympians are pretty much evenly matched until Prometheus switches sides, okay? Prometheus has foresight that Zeus will win. And so he walks out on Saturn and the Titans, his brother and sister gods, and he joins the ranks of Zeus. And with joining the ranks of Zeus, he's also privy to Saturn's plans, to the way that the Titans think, their strategies, all these sorts of things, and the Titans lose in the War of Heaven. Uh, Zeus wins, 
and he he establishes his brothers and sisters uh, on Mount Olympus, and this this begins the reign of Olympus. So Prometheus already has a Venus and Aries flavor to him. You know, he he went and he switched sides. He walked out on. He betrayed. Okay, um, the the side that he was with. Why is betrayal associated with Venus and Aries? Because Mars cuts. We talk about war, Mars as war, competition, strife. Mars is also associated to anything that cuts ties or bonds. And so a betrayal, you know, you're cutting ties with who you were with previously, and you're moving to someone else, and you're kind of even feeding them to the sharks. And this is all bound up in the Promethean legend. But Prometheus doesn't stop there. Prometheus is put in charge of the creation of humankind, which he creates for clay. And humankind is basically created to be slaves to the Olympians. Like the like mortals aren't even, you know, the the gods and goddesses don't even really want to talk to them, you know, type of thing. I mean, that the that that they, they die quickly. They don't live forever forever like immortals do. They die quickly. So, so, and they die, die even quicker because they're so primitive at this time. Their lifespans are very, very short at this time because, you know, all they have, all they do is hunt and gather and, 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 and grovel and, 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 and eat grub off the ground. They're, they're messy. They're stinky. Um, they're, they're more than half naked and they're just a miserable lot. That's before Prometheus brings mankind fire. Okay, Prometheus steals fire from heaven and he brings it down to mankind who's little more than an animal. And he teaches mankind how to use fire as a weapon, how to use fire to illuminate, how to use fire to cook, how to use fire to smolt and melt metals as technology. So Prometheus teaches mankind basically how to fare for themselves through the use of fire, all right? Zeus, when he finds out, is horrified. He's furious. You know, how can, how can Prometheus, you know, and he should have known. Prometheus went and betrayed Saturn, Zeus's father, and now Prometheus has betrayed Zeus. He's betrayed Zeus because he's gone down to mankind. He's given them fire, shown, shown them the arts of fire, so he's lifted mankind's status above an animal, and mankind might actually become a divinity one day if this isn't taken care of immediately. All right. Now Zeus punishes Prometheus immediately. He has immediate. Uh, he has uh, Prometheus uh, bound in chains and taken to the side of a mountain and chained there. And every day, an eagle shows up and eats his liver. You know, and Prometheus being an immortal, the liver regrows, and the following day the eagle comes and eats the liver, and this is great agony, and it's going to go on till the end of time. And of course, what's fascinating about this is that the eagle is Zeus's bird, uh, what we would call nowadays a spirit animal, and the liver is the part of the body that Jupiter is associated to. Jupiter is the Roman name of Zeus, and so we see that motif. And this is the punishment of Prometheus, and he will never escape it. But Zeus isn't done with mankind yet. He's furious, and he doesn't want mankind to rival the gods. So what Zeus does is he sends Pandora. Pandora is made from clay and mud, just like mankind is, made from earth. And she is created by Hephaestus, who is the uh, god of the kiln who fashions and creates the marvelous uh, weapons and shields of Olympus, as well as the Olympian temples and goblets and furnishings and all these sorts of stuff. Uh, Hephaestus is a great technician, and he's a great craftsman. And so he crafts from mud and earth Pandora. And so Zeus sends Pandora down to earth, and she has a jar. And he sends her to Prometheus's brother, Epimetheus. Okay. So um, Epimetheus lives on earth and he's without a wife. And Zeus sends her a wife, a male order wife, a, a, an Olympian ordered wife, uh, Pandora, who shows up with a jar. And uh, Epimetheus is, you're the most beautiful thing. And she's like, am I? And he's like, 
yes, you're, you're, you're stunning. Come on in. And she's like, only if you, if you want me to. And he's like, I do want you to come inside. Come inside and make yourself comfortable. Now, Epimetheus was warned by Prometheus long time ago never to accept a gift from Zeus, okay? Um, and, and Epimetheus was like, absolutely, I'll never accept a gift from Zeus. And he's like, promise, Epimetheus. And Epimetheus says, I promise, I promise. So Epimetheus says to her, why didn't you come inside? And she's like, I'd love to come inside. And he's like, where do you come from? And she's like, Zeus, do you know him? And he's like, oh, of course I know Zeus. And she's like, he says to say hi. And he sent me and I showed up. Hi. You know, he's like, come on inside. And so he completely forgets never to accept a gift from Zeus. Uh, where Prometheus means foresight to think ahead. Epimetheus, uh, the name means afterthought <laughs> or late counseling or slow on the uptake. And Epimetheus is definitely slow on the uptake. So he uh, marries Pandora. She becomes his wife. She has a jar. And um, he's off in the field doing Epimethean things, maybe uh, farming or something along those lines. And one day... Pandora sort of like looks at the jar and wonders, I wonder what's inside that. And she goes and like a box of chocolates, she sort of like opens the top of the jar and all of these horrible things come out. Okay. If you're, if you're familiar with Pandora's box, it was originally a job, jar, but it becomes a box in, in later tellings. Every conceivable ill, every conceivable um, anxiety, depression, malicious thought, pestilence. Um, aggravation, violence, all of the evils and demons of humanity come pouring out of this jar. And she's horrified by what she's released into the world. And, and, and she takes the jar lid and she puts it right back on top of the jar again. And of course, uh, traps the one last entity that was there, who was hope. And sort of like knocks on the edge of the jar, like Tinkerbell, like, let me out. And she's like, no, no. What horrible things have I done? So this idea of Pandora's box, that, that's really how we, know, uh, how we know the myth. The idea of Pandora's box bringing ills and horrors and anxieties into the world is connected to the legend of Prometheus. This is done in punishment to Prometheus bringing fire of heaven down to earth. Okay. And you can see the parallels there. You know, uh, uh, Robert Oppenheimer um, is, 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 organizes and facilitates the creation of the atomic bomb. Uh, the, the, the essential, the, the absolute uh, uh, dominant horror of our lives is, is the atomic bomb, um, which basically elevates humankind to godhood. Before the atomic bomb, um, it was only God that could uh, destroy the world. It was God who set um, hurricanes or, 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 or storms or pestilence or droughts, you know, upon the world. Um, when we get to that point in the history of our civilization where the atomic bomb is created and the things that follow it, like global warming, etc., Human beings don't have a God that they're afraid of anymore because they've become that in their capacity to destroy and, um, and in their capacity to potentially create life. But swinging like a pendulum between either destroying or creating life, um, destroying planet or creating planet, um, that, of course, is the great public discourse to this day. And all of these things are very much connected to the Promethean quality of Oppenheimer's story. But all of that, I find, is very much rooted in the ruling planet Venus uh, being in Aries. Uh, Pandora is that, that, that can be seen as that malicious Venus, you know, a Venus who brings, she's not really malicious. Pandora really comes and shows up with a jar and opens it. But what she does is that she brought those things. Okay, and so that's why she's blamed. You know, women are always blamed. It's like women are blamed with Eve and women are blamed with Venus and, and, and with Pandora. And the Greeks were a very misogynistic society. But anyway, um, but these things still come down to us today. So 
So what are we supposed to understand? You know, let's say you've got a ruling planet in Venus, uh, which is in Aries, and um, what does that mean? Does that mean that you're, you're Pandora, <laughs> that you bring discord and distress and disruption wherever you go? No. What it means is that it gives a Mars blend to the Venusian energy. And a lot of good things can come out of that. For instance, think about fire. We can think about fire as like the wildfires that rampage through different states and, and, and um, destroy things. And fire can certainly be that and do that. But fire is also a power that can be harnessed. Uh, fire is something that can light, you know, in its form of electricity. It's something that can heat. It's something that can uh, create beautiful sculpture and metallurgy and glass. So, so fire can be used in such a way to create beautiful things, if that's how we are predisposed. And with the Venus and Aries, you can be disposed in that creative way. But a Venus and Aries is no stranger to conflict and to distress and to difficulty. And one might think, well, maybe the ultimate answer of Venus and Aries to any sort of conflict or distress or difficulty is to bring peace, you know. But peace isn't always the answer. You know, sometimes, uh, or, or what kind of peace are you bringing? You know, is it peace after you've absolutely dominated and wiped out an enemy? Um, is it uh, peace by I'm going to acquiesce and I'm not going to put up a fight? And I'll just give up and surrender, and that will be done, you know, for for peace. You know, so what what how is peace forged? Which is a very powerful question with with Venus and Aries. And we can see these things in different attributes of our society. Take athletics, for instance. Athletics can get ferocious with the competition. Um, and did. Remember the Roman gladiators? You know, they fought literally to the death. But athletics these days is ruled by a kind of etiquette, you know, that 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 there are fouls, that there are rules, that are that that you can't do this to an opponent, um, that you have to honor uh the person that you're competing with. And this is also done through good sportsmanship, you know, that when you fight a really good fight or 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 you go to a game or a tournament or something along those lines, it doesn't end with like oh, I lost, I hate you, you know, or like, or it doesn't end with like, I didn't lose. I'm questioning the rules and the judge and the authority, you know? No, that, that, that's, you know, what I learned as a child. That's bad sportsmanship, you know, to be full of sour grapes or to throw the tennis racket and have a ten temper tantrum or something along those lines. Sportsmanship teaches us that you can compete vigorously, but after someone has won and someone has lost, you don't spit in their eye. You reach over and you shake their hand, you know, and there's even a moment in the Oppenheimer film where he does just that, you know, it's a very Venus and Aries thing. And his wife is horrified that, that he's doing that, but it was his way of honoring the opponent and trying to make amends or maybe showing that there are no hard feelings or whatever. It was still that Venusian instinct to build bridges and to reach across the divide even though someone has done something horrible. That hope, you know, who is the one who was finally left, let out of the jar at the end, but that hope of something emerging, something good emerging from a conflict um, is something that we practice in the rituals of our athletics. You know, that, that, that the, 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 the gist of athletics isn't to beat the opponent and to dominate them and then shame them, you know, it's to celebrate the triumph of a victor, but that triumph isn't set, okay, because a world record can be beat, can be broken, you know, someone else can come and upset that victor. And so in that spirit of good sportsmanship, of celebrating triumph and doing better, um, also comes how do you um, acknowledge that you lost? You know, how do you acknowledge an opponent who has lost, you know, in, in a way that you say, hey, that was really well done. We really went at it. That was that was fantastic. That was like the best swim meet I ever, you know, was against you. 
you know, and then this becomes a way of praising you know, rather than ridiculing or demeaning. And so this is one of the positive qualities of a Venus in Aries. If you look at our court system, and our court system is ruled by uh, Jupiter, but we also see Venus there in terms of Libra on the scales. Um, if you look at our court system, uh, you have a defense and you have a prosecutor who go at the case aggressively, okay? And the whole point is for them to make their case aggressively and to win. And what fuels that victory is either going to be, you know, you did something horrible, you criminal you, and you need to be punished for this. Or, you know, my client is being oppressed and unfairly charged, and we're going to push back against this, you know. But what's celebrated in this arena is, is, is that out of this conflict will come justice. Out of this conflict will come the truth, that good will prevail, prevail in that the truth will be known. So, so it's not just Marsy, you know, a court system. It's, it's, it's got Venus because it's done with a certain protocol. Venus rules all rules, laws, protocol, etiquette. It's done with a certain protocol. You can, you can, you can challenge and then to accept that the judge hasn't recognized your objection. And, and and this is all part of the, the the dance of justice. You know, it can be a battle in the courtroom. We'll talk about courtroom battles, but it's also a bit of a dance because you're outsmarting or maneuvering or even negotiating. There's always a Venusian quality. So what this Venus in Aries does is that it really combines the idea of combat and competition with trying to move in a direction that can promise something good or promise something better. Um, if you experience this in your chart romantically, you may be used to uh, romances where the person comes with a lot of stuff or you, you come with a lot of stuff or you're in dire straits or you get together under these very conflicting dramatic circumstances. There may be a fiery passion that's associated to your relationship that might make friends go like, oh, wow, why do they fight so much? Mm, you know, <laughs> kind of a bad thing. They might, you know, but but you and your partner know that it shows that you really care, you know, and and Aries is all about showing that I really care. It, it's not the tenderest way of showing that you care, or the most nurturing way of showing that you care, but you showed up, you fought your best fight, you know, you 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 went for the prize. That shows you care as far as an Aries is is concerned. And if you have Venus in Aries in the chart, there can be this feeling that, um, okay, you break up in order to make up. I mean, it's the Venus-Mars cycle, you know, break up, you know, Mars in order to make up the Venus. And this goes on and on and on. And what eventually emerges is a camaraderie, is a camaraderie between you and a spouse or a partner or a lover that is born of the fact that the person knows that challenges can be tough, that the person is always going to be there next to you during that challenge, that the person has suffered betrayals just like you have and knows exactly what that's like, and that that person's not going to leave you. You know, that person is going to be by your side. These are just some of the virtues that are showed up with Venus and Aries and are things to think about uh, if you have Venus as your ruling planet in the zodiac sign of Aries or happen to know someone who has Venus and Aries as well. If you enjoyed what you saw, please press the like button. It helps more than you know. If you could subscribe, that would be wonderful. If you press the video on the left, that will take you into a deep dive into other episodes of Christopher Rundstrom Astrology. I've had such a wonderful time visiting with you this week, and I can't wait to get together next time on Christopher Rundstrom Astrology.